now to the first session. So there's only 12 minutes in. So um, I hope everything I've said so far is relatively valuable. I, like I said, I don't, didn't want to, to waffle and I really respect your time. So the first session is by Dr. Patrick Tidmarsh. Patrick is an amazing guy. He's a Brit, but he's emigrated to Australia and he's he's been there for quite a few years. And you will notice, well, I notice a bit of an Australian twang in his um, British accent. Um, Patrick is a criminologist and he specializes in inter investigating sexual offenses. He has extensive experience of working with sex offenders directly and with the police directly. He's um, he's developed a methodology where on where to find evidence when investigating sexual offenses, because most of these offenses happen in private, happen behind closed doors. And what kind of ev evidence can you, you know, present? You know, if there's forensic DNA evidence, anything like that, that's usually explained away by the offender as consensual. It's very difficult to prove, but he's found a way of how you can prove it, how you can find the evidence and where you can find the evidence in sexual offense cases. So, um, in most cases, there is no external evidence, something like CCTV or anything like that. So how do you convict someone well, you're about to find out. So I'm going to play you this session now. Um, here goes Patrick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this rapid fire conference presentation. I'm going to talk about where the evidence is in sexual crime investigation. Essentially, my argument to you is that sexual offending and child sexual abuse are crimes of relationship, whether they happen over a Two minutes or 20 years they're a crime of relationship and rather than the story guiding us to where evidence might be my argument is the story is the evidence most of this offending takes place in private without other external corroboration so the story uh, and our ability through interviewing to gather that story is everything here are the topics i want to cover in brief over this next period of time i want to talk about how we used to investigate it and how we now investigate it, certainly here in Victoria with the whole story methodology that we've developed. I want to talk about counterintuitive or so-called counterintuitive victim behavior. I want to talk about our, our social scripts, uh, myths and misconceptions, and how previously we have focused on victim behavior and why would she do that? Why uh, did he go around to the guy's house? Why did she stay with him? And that through whole story, we've tried to get our investigators to focus not on why would she do that because we're still going to need to ask those questions but how did he get her to do that and then we're going to move on to grooming and understanding grooming in a bit more detail and evidence and where relevant evidence is so before we get to that i want to tell you two brief stories um, and then we'll come back to them um, at, at the end of the, the period so here's the first one a 22 year old young woman comes into a police station and says, I've been being sexually abused by my stepfather since I was 12. Um, we've just had a big argument because he wants his girlfriend to move in and he's kicking me out. And now I want to tell you everything that he's done to me. So what are our problems with um, looking at her behavior, judging her behavior, missing misconceptions, and most important of all, where's the evidence going to be in this particular case? Here's the second one. So a woman goes for a massage. She hasn't been to this particular place before. She usually goes somewhere else. And the first time she walks in uh, over a 45 minute massage, she um, takes off all her clothes for that massage. It's lying on the bed after about 40 minutes. She is uh, digitally raped over a period of several minutes. She um, thanks the masseur for his service, pays on the way out, and although she tells her sister that a bad thing has happened, she doesn't go to the police for two weeks. What are our problems when this comes to a fact finder and where's the evidence? Okay, so we'll come back to those later. Let's talk in a little bit more detail about all those things I mentioned. Um, and starting with, how did we used to investigate sexual crime? So to put it crudely, the way we used to talk about it was what went where, how far did it go in? What act can you charge him with? Because we have to particularize this. And can anyone back up what she's saying? And as the years roll by and the evidence becomes ever more irrefutable that the majority of this happens in private, that um, people are reluctant to come forward, only one in eight uh, adults 
uh, mostly women, although men obviously do get raped as well, but um, their reporting rates are even less than, than women who are offended against. And although it's harder to determine with children, maybe one in 10 children re report during childhood, an our Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse here in Australia found that the average time uh, people waited if they were abused to children to tell their report was over 20 years. So most people don't come forward and they don't come forward in part because of the way we as a community still understand sexual offending and sexual crime because of, for example, counter and so-called counterintuitive victim behavior. The more you understand sexual offending is a crime of manipulation and grooming and relationship, the more you understand that why people stay why so much of, uh, of what we know about offending it has been profoundly wrong, why injuries, for example, are much uh, less common, why DNA evidence uh, isn't as useful as one might think it would be, why there is so seldom external corroboration of what took place between those people. And so the shift needs to be not on judging victim behavior, and I haven't got time in 10 minutes to talk about our victim blaming culture or patriarchy or misogyny or any of the other structures in adversarial justice that are problematic, but assume that, you know, if we had longer, we'd get to those. Um, what we're talking about here really is where, when we do come to understand these stories, how can we better understand them? And how can we, as part of uh, the investigative stream and the prosecutorial stream, um, better uh, understand the story and present relevant evidence to, to a fact finder. So um, the breadth and depth of myths and misconceptions is huge. And whilst I have it, uh, we here produced this document uh, for our prosecutors and investigators. You can find it if you go online to um, Victoria Police Myths and Misconceptions, you, you, you can find this document. And also myself and a couple of other colleagues have written for uh, the Australian Institute of Criminology's Trends and Issues series on myths and misconceptions in adult sexual crime, and they're both free resources. Uh, feel free to get them online. And the reason they're important is because we as a community have uh, so many broad myths and misconceptions, and our police officers, our investigators come from the community, and so part of the training of them and understanding these crimes is to take them to those myths and misconceptions, see where they're from, and see by working through narrative after narrative why um, we can no longer uh, be subject to that, and, and, and then how better do you listen to victims. So the other thing we found when we first started working with investigators here back in 2007 is although they understood grooming, and I think everybody's heard that word now, most people see it as the kind of sexual end of grooming. And actually in terms of the gathering of relevant evidence and taking people's social scripts and presenting them with an alternative to that script that they can see, although I wouldn't, I don't think I would have done that, I understand why that person did that, or I understand why that person in those circumstances behaved the way they did, that <clears throat> understanding uh, grooming and um, what's in the literature is the qualitative elements of the narrative. Mostly grooming is what's going to explain that. So why that person did or didn't do what they did or didn't do. So we split it up into what we call grooming one and grooming two. So grooming one is power and control and authority. And, and that can take, I mean, well, in some cases it's, it's violence and there is no um, communication whatsoever aside from that violence. But far more often than not, in 90 five percent plus of cases you see significant grooming over minutes or hours or days or months or years uh, and and my biggest argument to you is that most of the relevant evidence that will persuade people of what took place in private is actually in the grooming one element of uh, the investigation. Um, it becomes more obvious when you come to grooming two. And so what will happen is you'll see uh, the power and control and authority element. Then the grooming two will come in and grooming one will keep running. And then uh, the first offense uh, will happen. And so that offense is also a part of that secret and they kind of act uh, in in um, in co you know in a cohesive form to to keep uh, the person being victimized quiet minimize the chances of the offender being told on and in in many cases as offenders have told me many times during treatment sessions uh, to try and make that uh, victim feel responsible for what's taking place for them um, and also you'll see particularly in child sexual abuse cases you'll see grooming one continue way after uh, the offending has stopped and grooming two has stopped so gro grooming is far and away the most important thing for our investigators to understand so it, the story is the evidence and in that story the grooming is where most of the relevant evidence is that they can gather
So um, let's go back to those two stories. Let's look at that 22 year old young woman. Now, no surprise, most of what persuaded, uh, and in this case, uh, a jury found him guilty, most of what persuaded them of that guilt was the grooming one behavior, particularly from the time he entered, he, as a step parent, he entered their family at age six. And what we were able to do by drawing a complete narrative from her was to show how he had over time separated her from her siblings and her mother, uh, in part created conflict, how he had sided with her whenever she was in trouble with, with her parent. Um, so this special relationship formed, how when he sometimes uh, went away for periods of time, she would go with him uh, out of that and how gradually he became the most important person in her life, isolated her from others, um, told her she was uh, they were soulmates but other people wouldn't understand etc etc and also she was then able to say that that uh, as a 22 23 year old she was still in a sexual relationship with him and that had continued right the way through even though he had been in other relationships uh, periodically through that time and as I don't have time for all the depth and breadth of evidence, uh, let me just say there were there was a remarkable level uh, of detail uh, about things he'd said, things he'd done, um, things about body image, things about touch that had changed and the way that he had gradually become the most important person in her life uh, and the only person in a way that she could rely on, even though that reliance was, was a lie and a distortion to, to feel safe out there, out there in the world. So uh, in some ways, even with historical cases and child sexual abuse cases, there's usually lots of depth and breadth in the narrative because there's usually lots of grooming, particularly grooming one. So let's talk about the massage story where it's only an hour uh, period that they're in, in contact with each other. What's he doing then? So she was able to detail how she had been for massages on multiple occasions, never been asked to take her underwear off before, and that he came up with a plausible excuse. Doesn't leave the room when uh, he says time to undress, but turns around and, and looks away. Uh, and she can talk about how she didn't want to make a fuss. She thought, well, you know, maybe he's not interested in, you know, maybe it's just what he does. Maybe I thought it was too awkward to say, I'm sorry, but you need to leave. Um, even when he turns around to, to ask her a question in the middle of her undressing, he doesn't look her up and down. He looks her in the, in the eye. So she pushes her thought away about, well, that's, that's not right. And so you see, as happens in most cases, that grooming is done, uh, and clearly this wasn't the first time that he'd done it, that grooming is done in such a way that it's hard for people to, to challenge it, and that they're more likely to find a plausible explanation for that grooming. And again, to cut a relatively long story short, what he was able to do over a 40 minute period is, is take her from... Um, the authority she had when she came in the room to a vulnerability of uh, naked uh, in a place she'd never been before to a man who had behaved oddly uh, and unpredictably but was very good at his job at least for the first part of the massage um, and so by the time the offending took place um, as is so often the case here uh, there was shock uh, there was trauma and that uh, produced um, uh, the freeze response or, or tonic immobility you know, to um, look at its scientific terminology. So she froze on the table, uh, was unable. She said she was she was screaming in her head, but she didn't even know if she was screaming out loud because of that freeze reaction, which was yeah a relatively. I mean, it was shocking, but it's a relatively common theme that comes up when when uh, women talk about these particular stories. And so when he said at the end, "How was that?" she felt compelled to say that was fine thank you and so back to his distorted thinking he can say well, yeah, another one you know who, who wanted i knew what she wanted she paid on the way out because she didn't want to make a fuss and she didn't know who else was in on this or understood this about this man and when her sister suggested to her that she go to the police she thought oh my god what are they going to think of me and my behavior and so she says i'll just put it behind me and it isn't until she can't eat she can't sleep uh, and then she drives into work one day and although she loves her job, she couldn't get out of a car that she says, right, that's it. And I'm going to the police. And so my argument is we have an expert in the room. We don't need an expert witness really to tell us what took place here. That if we gather the narrative completely, 
the expert is there to tell us, well, why did you do or not do what you did or didn't do in that moment? Why wait two weeks? Why not challenge him in that moment? And we can have answers to that question because fact finders can understand what took place if we take them to the whole story of it. And we take them to that person's experience in that moment and provide them with information about why they did or didn't do on that point. And particularly if we can make the offender audible and visible so that they can see the pressures being brought to bear upon them. So where's the relevant evidence in sexual crime cases? It's in the story and particularly it's in the building blocks of the grooming and manipulation uh, of that abuse. Thanks very much for listening. Right. So that was Dr. Patrick Titmarsh. Um, I hope you got a lot out of that. There was a question about um, that video, which I am able to answer. Um, so Digitally raped. Digitally raped. Does this mean the massage was filmed or was she indecently assaulted or raped? Now, this is a very good question because the term digital rape is a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with it. So digital rape means the offender rapes the victim not with his penis, but with one of the digits of his hand. So he was basically using one or more fingers. Um, I'm glad that was asked because um, a lot of people will have had the same question and it's not, it's not something that normal people use in their normal day to day talking um the the overlays that came up with the key points in the videos that I w that was me who put that in the video so i did some editing and um uh, i meant to I, I noticed that there was a spelling mistake in there now if anyone else noticed a spelling mistake and something that i put on the video the first person to call it out or, um you know to put it into the comments is going to get a shout out from me so um i raised my hands that was my mistake it was not patrick's i put a spelling mistake in there if you know what it was if you know which word it was just put it in right so my discussion the notes that i took from this video so that you don't have to take notes and you can just concentrate on um, on watching. Sexual offending and child sexual abuse are crimes of relationship, not single events. The story or the history is the evidence. We need to learn all, all about it in interview. Sexual offending is a crime of manipulation, grooming and relationship. The need to shift from why did she or why didn't she to how did he get her to do that? So the blame is on him, not on her. Often there is no independent or forensic evidence. Essential to understanding grooming, establishing power, control and authority, not necessarily sexual. So grooming is not necessarily sexual, okay? The main part is establishing the power and control over the victim. Grooming remains active to keep the victim quiet and make them feel responsible. Did you pick up on that? So in his sessions with sex, of sex offenders, Patrick was told many times that offenders deliberately try to make their victims whoever they are, even children, they deliberately try to make them feel responsible for the abuse. And grooming is where most of the evidence can be found. Right, so these are my notes from <clears throat> Patrick's session. So as I said, he's actually written a book about this. And um, this is the book, it's called The Whole Story. So if you're interested in what he's just told us about, then go and um, find this book. Now it's, um, the, the link is in the comments now, it's an affiliate link. What that means is, is absolutely fine. It's just an, a link that is um, traceable back to me. So this means you pay the normal price that you would pay if you, you know, if you bought the book on on a different, you know, on, on Amazon directly. You you found you searched it and you found it directly. And Patrick or the publisher gets the same price, but Amazon will give me a little bit of a um, percentage for putting you and um, Amazon together. Okay, so nobody's missing out except Amazon if you want to see it that way. But it's an affiliate link. I just need to make you aware of that. You can obviously use, you know, buy it anywhere you want.